Paul okay. Chesson is professor of philosophy at UC San Diego. Thank you, Roger. Uh, I promised to you on the body of Christ that I shall be brief. <laughs> Roger asked me to speak about the American philosopher John Rawls, I believe because he wanted there to be at least a brief uh, representation of the possibility of a secular ground for morality as opposed to a supernatural or a religious ground. John Rawls is certainly uh, a good choice to address that issue and uh, I'm, uh, 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 I, I, I have an obligation here to Dan Dennett. I've just seen his picture here, but I think I'm going to show you his picture at the end of my talk rather than at the beginning. So I will probably be appealing to his uh, wisdom at some point. John Rawls is an American philosopher. Uh, those of us who were graduate students in the mid-60s read an early paper by him called Justice as Fairness which was the seed from which a very large book called A Theory of Justice subsequently grew. Uh, he has been one of the most influential um, moral slash political slash economic philosophers uh, of the last 50 years. I, I believe he recently passed away. He was, uh, he was at Harvard. And uh, the basic idea is one which I think you will find appealing. I'm going to criticize it. Uh, I give you fair warning beforehand as secular grounds for uh, an all-encompassing morality. I don't think it's going to succeed, but uh, let's at least entertain the possibility. Rawls' move here is in the tradition that you will recognize, a tradition that attempts to ground a system of moral convictions, a system of moral, uh, political, economic practices in self-interest. But it's an unusually clever way of trying to do it. He has us imagine a rational person choosing between alternative political systems, between, say, the uh, uh, political uh, system, economic system of Soviet Russia in the uh, 50s and 60s, or the uh, liberal regulated capitalism of America, or think of any pair that might interest you. Uh, the person, imagine it to be yourself, is allowed to look at these two systems and see what um, Arrangements are made for the distribution of money, for the distribution of rights, for the uh, organization of society. But you are to make your choice between these competing systems from what has famously come to be called the veil of ignorance. The veil of ignorance makes you ignorant of how smart you are or how stupid you are, how high-born you are or how low-born you are how charming you are, uh, or how dull, how good-looking, or how homely. You are kept uh, ignorant of all of these things because what Rawls wants you to be ignorant of is where you're going to be placed in this society. Are you going to be a mogul on Wall Street? Are you going to be digging ditches in Alabama? Are you going to be locked in a prison somewhere because you smoke too much marijuana? All of these things you don't know. But the basic idea is after you've made your choice and say, I go for this society, you are going to be picked up by a, a, a god and placed at random in that society. According to Rawls, the rational person will attempt to choose that society which has the kindness and most benign minimum level of well-being. It's the maximize the minimum level strategy. And it's entirely, uh, uh, at least right off the bat, it's appealing. Why would one risk uh, anything else than uh, guaranteeing that even if you happen to land in the worst possible position within this society, it'll still be bearable because all of the other alternatives were worse. That's basically the story. It is in the tradition of things that you recognize, like the do unto others as you would be done by. Uh, it makes contact with um, the sorts of intuitions that people already have, whether they're religious or not, 
And it has the advantage, note well, of justifying a liberal form of capitalism which allows significant uh, differences in the level of income if the payoff of allowing those differences is that all of the boats at the bottom are raised. The aim ultimately is to raise those bottommost boats as high as possible and it would be foolish, says Rawls, as the Soviet Union was foolish, to do away with significant differences in income if the result of doing that was to lower the bottommost boats. Why would anybody do that? Well, he became, I think, justly famous for this. And the claim was that the filter of the veil of ignorance would be an effective method for allowing a purely rational being who was interested in their own welfare, but they weren't allowed to know too much about who they were. So they had to be worried about everybody's welfare because they didn't know where they were going to be stuck. This is, uh, this is a way of identifying a certain mode of social practice, a certain set of uh, political, economic, and moral rules as being uniquely rational. No appeal to transcendent gods. Uh, this is a way to make decisions about uh, mor moral systems, indeed economic and political systems, uh, without appealing to anything like that. Now, I, that's all the history I'm going to give you. I tell you uh, why I am not a Rawlsian if you like. Uh, one of the reasons that us uh, philosophy students seized on this is that it did seem to be an entirely secular way, one which appealed to reason, uh, but not just pure reason. You had to know something about uh, economic systems and the way they would play out when the, uh, uh, the game button was pressed. But it wasn't appealing to supernatural things. It wasn't appealing to a direct moral sense that allowed you to pick out what was moral and to put aside that which wasn't moral. It was appealing. Forty years later, I think it's wrong. I think it may be a, I think it's wrong. I think it may be a good thought experiment to motivate useful political discussion. I don't think it's a test, a litmus test for genuine morality over, uh, or genuine justice over uh, injustice. And here's why. It reminds me, first of all, of a similar move that a famous philosopher named René Descartes made in the field of natural science. René Descartes was living at a time when uh, humanity, at least in Europe, was crawling out from under the oppression of the, uh, the Dark Ages and the Catholic Church, which had pretty much, at that time, forsworn uh, interest in uh, or even tolerance of the natural sciences. And Descartes has become famous for trying to find another authority by which to evaluate adequate or correct science other than uh, the Bible uh, uh, or any other kind of authority that you'd want. And he's famous for saying it's reason and the clear and distinct apprehensions that the faculty of reason can give you. Uh, here is Descartes, who was himself responsible for many of the major advances in uh, modern mathematics. The Cartesian coordinate system is named after him. He is the fellow who algebraized uh, geometry. He's the fellow who came up with the law of conservation of momentum. Uh, he corrected uh, Galileo's um, uh, uh, law of motion and uh, then gave it to Newton. They call it Newton's uh, uh, first law, a body free of forces will move in a straight line at constant velocity. Uh, well, that isn't Newton's first law. It's dear old Descartes. So Descartes was responsible for a good deal of modern science, and his story was that he could tell which laws were genuine laws of nature by putting his faculty of reason to work, uh, contemplating the law in question, and if he could get a hold of it clearly and distinctly, then it had to be a law. Well, now, we're not tempted to buy this story that Descartes held out to us. We might have been sympathetic at the time. He was hiding out in the Netherlands, hoping to avoid the fate of uh, Giordano Bruno and uh, Galileo, uh, one of whom had been burnt at the stake and the other who was uh, put under house arrest for uh, their scientific activities. And uh, we won't accept it because we know that the reality is very different. 
We got to the level of scientific understanding that Descartes commanded through an awful lot of hard work that started way back with the Sumerians and the Persians and the Egyptians and the Greeks. And we climbed through some work done by uh, the uh, Arab civilization in North Africa. And we have since climbed upwards through Newton and through Einstein and into quantum mechanics, we know that the idea that there is a single litmus test that can tell you what's a true or a false scientific theory is nonsense. How can we tell the difference between good and bad theories? Well, the answer is with great difficulty. It takes long periods of historical time to accumulate evidence, to submit theories to uh, systematic tests, but we manage to learn over hundreds of years, over thousands, over, well, fives and tens of thousands of years. Now, let us come back to the moral domain. I want to suggest that uh, Rawls was wrong in exactly the same way that Descartes was. The idea that there's a simple litmus test to determine what is a valid moral rule or a just system of distributing goods in society is just as silly as Descartes' idea. What we have to do in order to get a grip on those very, very important facts is look back upon the history of the human race as it has come through the Persian civilization and the Egyptian civilization and the Grecian and <sighs> Renaissance. We have gone through a series, the human race, a series of experiments of living under this form of social organization, this form of uh, economic organization, this form of um, criminal justice and distribution and so forth. And we have modified it steadily as we go, especially in countries like England and France, where you can go back 600 years, or uh, uh, in the case of Britain, 1,200 years to the, to the, the 1,200? No, 800 to the Magna Carta. Uh, and in countries like the U.S. where you can go back 300 years and have a continuous development of common law. Just think of the judiciary modifying how they interpret the uh, law that's been laid down. And there are steady changes in the law. The shoe often pinches. We learn that what was a good idea uh, in some people's mind, like prohibition, turns out to be a very bad idea for all of the reasons that... Uh, uh, where, where, where's my friend? There he is. Thank you, Mel. Um, we learn from an awful painful experience, and we slowly modify what we think is true. 